In this episode of Outback Coroner... We told her, this man will kill you. He said she's on the floor with knives in her. No one else had mentioned homicidal threats. I knew he was paranoid and thinking that I was trying to poison him. He liked his gunja and they wanted him. Somebody must have set him up. The punishment that he got wasn't deserved. We've all heard about prisoners escaped in their hospital gowns. If I had done something differently, that could have changed this event. There's no major community in Australia more remote than that of Alice Springs, which sits at the geographic heart of the country. This dusty outback community falls under the jurisdiction of Northern Territory Coroner Greg Kavanagh, a regular visitor from his home base in the capital, Darwin. His first ever case here was 30 years ago, a death that made world headlines. Dingoes take little babies. That's a rather fa famous coronial case. Baby Azaria's mother, Lindy Chamberlain, was tried for murder and spent three years in prison. It would take 32 years for the coroner's office to officially declare that Azaria was in fact killed by a dingo. I was part of the original defence team. A very courageous woman, a very innocent woman. Coroner Greg Kavanagh has come to town for two inquests. One looks into a death in custody. A family that's angry and upset about the treatment of their loved one in custody, who was sick and taken to the hospital and shackled to the bed. The other involves a brutal murder. Someone got stabbed to death. The person who stabbed her to death was a former boyfriend. Both had mental illness problems. This week's all about death, misery, grief, hopefully revelation and closure. Alice Springs Police are investigating the suspicious death of a woman who was found with multiple stab wounds. In 2011, the murder of 36-year-old Jasmine Roenfeldt in this apartment block shocked family, friends, and this close-knit community of 25,000 people. Rocky Manu fatally stabbed his flatmate in their Bloomfield Street unit in Alice Springs in November 2011. This lovely girl was stabbed to death in a frenzied, violent, vicious attack. Jasmine's mother is looking for answers from the coroner. There are so many things that are wrong with the system that created this murder. I want to know how this is possible. It shouldn't have happened to my daughter. It should never have happened. The families of both the victim and the perpetrator gather for an inquest that will last four days. The death of this young lady is not a death that is to be grieved by you alone. The death of any one of us is a death of part of our community. All stand. Coroner's Court of the Northern Territory is now open. We're starting an inquest today, and what's it all about? Counsel assisting Greg Kavanagh is Dr Peggy Dwyer, a Sydney barrister specialising in coronial law. The circumstances of Jasmine's death are genuinely shocking. She died as a result of multiple stab wounds and police quickly identified that Rocky Manu was the main suspect and had to be detained as soon as possible. Rocky suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. When he was unwell, he would hear voices and experience psychotic delusions and hallucinations. In the months before the murder, his behaviour towards his flatmate Jasmine became very controlling. Her mother, Mary Gleason, became increasingly concerned. He would remove the television, refuse to let the television be watched, remove the computers, read her mail, 
determine who could come to the flat and who not. She needed to tell him where she was, all sorts of things like that. We told her, if you do not leave, this man will kill you. And she promised me that the next time he took her gear, she would move out. And the next time was the last time. Exactly when Jasmine died is uncertain. But when she didn't arrive at work, colleagues went around to her flat. We tried to get into the unit. Bruce said, I'll go around the back and have a look. And he went into the back courtyard and stood up and looked in the kitchen window. And he came running around the front of the unit. And I never, ever want to see that look on anybody's face again. He was horror. And he said, she's on the floor with knives in her. Jasmine died from multiple stab wounds. Rocky Manu was arrested within hours of her body being found. I heard a call come over to say that uh, he'd actually been sighted on uh, Dulia Road. So I made my way there to see whether I could assist. I heard one of the constables calling on Rocky to stop, taking him to the ground. Did Rocky say anything to you after he had been detained at the scene? He said, is she all right? Is she all right? Yeah. In spite of being deeply traumatised, Rocky's family have rallied around him. Did you ever think that Rocky would harm Jasmine? I was in disbelief. I didn't think anything like that would ever happen. I, I was like, somebody must have set him up. You know, I was... I was sh and shocked. He would never be violent. He was gentle. He was like a gentle giant, they used to call him. Rocky Manu's family are well known in Alice. They came here from New Zealand over 20 years ago. Yeah, we're a family of uh, with six children and our mother who... She was widowed she at She was 30. widowed at 30 by our father, who was also diagnosed with schizophrenia. Rocky's brother wrote to the coroner and requested an inquest. They responded to us by saying, well, it actually comes from the victim's family, not the perpetrator's family. Yeah. Um, so and you so approached... we, we spoke to her mother, Mary, and she agreed. In spite of this tragedy, these two mothers share a common goal. Through the coroner, they want to understand how the system failed their children. I want to know why the cracks were there, how wide the cracks are, and uh, what they're doing, the health department, to see that it doesn't happen again. Possibly Jasmine was drawn to Rocky because she too had a history of mental illness. All the same, her early years were very happy, if somewhat unusual. When she was four, her parents moved to the famous indigenous community of Hermansburg, then a Lutheran mission, about an hour's drive west of Alice Springs. It was, a, I believe, a really good experience to be at Hermansburg, going out with Aboriginal kids down to the nearby Fink River. Jasmine would return to this very special place throughout her life. It was a beautiful time for us kids. We were free. We'd go on adventures and we could go walking anywhere. In the community, we were completely safe. It gave us a real sense of belonging. After six years, Mary and David split up. Mary moved her three young children to Victoria. Jasmine excelled at school, but in her late teenage years, she was the victim of a violent crime that changed her life dramatically. Yeah, she had been assaulted. And that impacted on her? Hugely. She became psychotic, distressed, and really she lost control of her mental health. She was sick at that time. She was really sick. She was in the top 2%. I've got a 19-year-old at Melbourne Uni who's in the top 2%. He's a beautiful, beautiful boy. And I thought, gee whiz, how would I feel if in three or four years' time when he's graduated and uh, if he became mentally ill? Eventually, she was admitted to hospital in Alice Springs with bipolar disorder. She had a 
an extreme breakdown here. She was medicated, of course, and then put into the care of Macca. Macca is an NGO that helps mentally ill people. It was here that Jasmine first met Rocky, whose sister Claudia, as general manager, was running the place. Because Rocky had a mental illness, I thought I had something to contribute to try and um, be part of the solution. Claudia took Jasmine under her wing and her health improved. My working relationship with her was very close. It was a joy to work with her. Yeah, I loved her dearly. She was really, really grateful for their help. Claudia and Sue Coombs uh, really mentored her very well. Jasmine's mental health improved so much that she was employed by Claudia and eventually rented a house from Macca in 2007. We bought those units to try and integrate people with a mental illness into the community without the community saying a mad person lives there. In 2010, Macca arranged for Rocky to share Jasmine's flat, and eventually she and Rocky had a brief relationship. She really loved him, and she really believed he could get well if he would take the medication, if he would see the doctor, and she urged and encouraged him. It's a significant question for the coroner. A young woman with a history of mental illness and a man with schizophrenia brought together in a Macca flat. Wasn't this a recipe for disaster? I've seen him angry, but angry to the point that he was going to hurt somebody? No way. What happened? Were the systems in place to see that this person was properly medicated, that the public was safe if he became psychotic? Were there safeguards there? Were protocol, protocols followed? That's what we're going to examine. As a coroner, Greg Kavanagh looks at deaths in the community. In his secondary role as a magistrate, he helps prevent them. Once each month, he goes on magistrate's circuit, this time to Kakadu, one of the most exotic areas in the country. We got a light plane because for most of the year, especially during the wet season, you can't drive any further and you have to take your chances across the Carl's Crossing, which is across the East Alligator River. The East Alligator is alive with crocodiles. They gather here to feed on the large barramundi that swim the rapids. Recently, on the nearby Mary River, tragedy struck. A good friend of mine's son was uh, taken by a crocodile last weekend, and that's a death reportable to my office. Him and his mate swam to the other side and were swimming back. We'll say no more about that for a while. Though. Australians just got to realise that they're man-eating animals. Today, Magistrate Kavanagh is heading for a remote Aboriginal community. He's landed in a historic town with the traditional name of Gunbalanya. We're in a lovely, lovely, lovely part of Australia. It's a fairly law-abiding place. But with budget cuts on the horizon, these regular trips may be coming to an end. There's a move by bureaucrats for these courts to sit by a video conference from Darwin. I don't want to do that. It's Orwellian. A white man in a white institution in a predominantly white city in Darwin on the TV to this remote area, traditional town of a thousand Aboriginal people, sending people to jail. I don't think so. A lot of these communities, the only institution of justice they see is the police station. The institution should reside in the community, not on a TV. What's going on this morning? I know you're short-staffed. That man that's in custody, can he be brought down? When asked his reason for driving whilst intoxicated, the defendant replied, just taking the children for a ride. For the sake of yourself and the kids, you have a few drinks, don't drive anymore, hey? Let's come forward, sir. He's going to plead guilty to five, is he? Take a seat, please. Facts, please. The defendant threw the one-metre 
metal poles striking and shattering the windscreen directly in front of her. I regard this matter as very serious. Find the charge proven and we'll find him guilty. Put the charge. At the time of the offence, the defendant was subject to a domestic violence order. You have to take these orders very seriously. I'm going to make it a very expensive drink that night. The coroner knows that it's the children who will inherit the legacy of alcohol-fueled domestic violence in remote communities. If you've been drinking, go and sleep it off somewhere else. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Dad was a, a, a labourer and uh, drank too much. I understand what causes domestic violence. I understand what causes uh, people to become alcoholics. Facts, please. The defendant has then punched the victim with a closed fist to the back of her head. Police arrived a short time thereafter and observed the victim sitting outside the station wearing only her underwear bottoms. She's so terrified she ends up in a pair of uh, uh, knickers outside the police station crying for help. That's terrible. Uh, the community's got to be told that's terrible. You put her to the ground and then you punched her while she was on the ground. And this was to the mother of your four children. What you did was brutal, it was cowardly. Acting on behalf of the community, I will continue to send a message out that it is completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Well, the community thinks it's terrible. Was it worthwhile coming out today? Yes. Thank you. Adjourn the court. Back in Alice Springs, Greg Kavanagh's inquest into the murder of Jasmine Roenfeldt by her flatmate Rocky Manu continues. It soon becomes clear that perceptions vary as to the seriousness of Rocky Manu's paranoid schizophrenia. Your Honour, Rocky did not have a significant history of violence. However, on one occasion in 2005 that was known to Dr Abusa, he was found in a public place carrying an axe that he said he was using to protect himself. At the Alice Springs Hospital, Dr Prosper Abusa has been treating Rocky for nearly two decades. On occasions, the psychiatrist had him incarcerated and forcibly medicated. But this was not his preferred method of treatment. So, Doctor, was it your view that Rocky could be better engaged if there was no community treatment order in place? Yeah, that has always been a pattern with him. The more you engage him, the more he cooperates. This meant that Rocky promised to take his drugs, and the doctor took him at his word. In effect, there was no legal obligation placed on Rocky to take his medicine. That's OK. That was your professional judgment about it, and you stick to that today, yes? Yes, sir. The doctor worked hand in hand with community centre CAMS. They were responsible for providing and monitoring Rocky's medication, even in the absence of a legally binding arrangement. Uh, we have community management orders and we treat uh, mentally ill people in the community, as opposed to 30 or 40 years ago in asylums, and that's as it should be. But Rocky was not easy to manage. Nurses reported aggression, and a young medico visiting Alice Springs wrote a report. Rocky has had 20 admissions to this mental health unit. His admissions follow a pattern, often involving non-compliance of medication. He's a history of making homicidal threats. Rocky was at risk of further deterioration, and this increased the risk of outright aggression. No one else had mentioned homicidal threats. And here is a young junior doctor rotating through Alice Springs, apparently, who signs off with that description, which is eerie, because it turned out to be true. Rocky was never charged by police with aggressive behaviour in public. And at the time he moved in with Jasmine, reports suggested that when medicated, he was very easygoing. It started off good. They were lovers at one stage for a short period of time. It gets down to people maybe should have picked up the disharmony in the last several months. The young doctor had noted that Rocky had a history of not taking his medication. And somehow, he managed to get away with it. If we confronted him about, are you OK, are you well, have you been on your medication, then he wouldn't necessarily want to associate with that person and yeah. may disengage. disengage. Rocky kept away from a lot of people who could have helped him. 
We don't live in a perfect world. Occasionally mentally ill people are gonna do the wrong thing. They're gonna lie and cheat and be violent and kill. I was unhappy with this clinical care in the last five to six years. And why was that? Because he was left too long, because he wasn't case managed, because he had got so unwell. In May, seven months before Jasmine's death, Rocky was forcibly hospitalised by his doctor. But after 11 days, he was released again with no enforced medication. His sister Claudia was not happy. So I made it very clear that I thought he was becoming unwell and that he should be on a community management order. And we had a pretty big fight in front of the clinical team. Rocky's doctor believed the community house would supervise Rocky's medication. But without a community order in place, they thought the doctor was doing it. Amazingly, neither of them checked with each other. Is it fair to say that you were urging him to put Rocky on a community management order? That's right. The doctor, he had a good therapeutic relationship with him. He thought he would take his medicine and uh, he trusted him. He thought it'd be, everything would be okay. He's the consultant, he's the expert. Uh, in hindsight, things weren't okay. Rocky promised his doctor that every two weeks he would take a slow release and his psychotic injection. He kept his word for a while, but three months before the murder, he stopped, and nobody did anything about it. Without medication, Rocky would become paranoid and delusional. Yet he continued to live with Jasmine, posing another question for the coroner, who was looking out for her. For coroner Greg Kavanagh, the days immediately before Jasmine Roenfeld's death come into focus. How are you? Yeah, I'm a little bit anxious. OK. Before Rocky moved in, Sandy Yandel shared Jasmine's flat. You asked Jasmine whether she was scared at some stage around then. She had said that he was getting quite aggressive, um, quite angry towards her. He'd actually said to her that he was going to control her because she couldn't control her life well enough herself, so he was going to do it for her. Sandy was the last person to see Jasmine alive when they went for their regular afternoon swim on Monday afternoon. You're well? Yes. You just relax, OK? That same day, Rocky's sister, Jackie, noticed he was acting strangely. He was looking around, kind of like a look that we know when he's unwell, right. in his eyes. I asked him if he wanted a drink. When I got him the cordial, he walked straight inside and got a glass of water and he didn't touch the cordial. So I knew he was paranoid and thinking that I was trying to poison him. And then I asked him, are you hearing voices? What's happening? Are you hearing the voices? The voices? He said no. What's going on? When there's a mental health emergency, a crisis assessment team can be called to defuse situations. I said, do you want me to call the CAT team? Then he got a bit upset. And then he said, take me home right now. He didn't recognise the car, so I thought, Oh, that's a bit odd. I picked you up heaps, Rocky. He said, oh, it must just look bigger. Then he asked me to take him for a drive around town. I was just driving around and around, and then I said to him, look, I can't keep driving around and around, Rocky. I've got to go home. Did he say anything when you dropped him off? Yes, he said to me, oh, I'm not going to talk to you again for a while. The next day, still concerned, Jackie decided to call for the crisis team. The people who are trained in de-escalation techniques, who can try and talk them down to a level that they would agree to treatment. Claudia had been out of town for several months. She was under the impression that her brother's mental health was being properly managed. 
she was not immediately alarmed by her sister's description of Rocky's behaviour. Although the cordial was, and even what he was saying was, bizarre behaviour, I didn't take it as, you know, he's seriously unwell. I see. It wasn't super concerning. OK. The crisis team was in the car when a call came through to call them off. Claudia decided to call the cat team off and then we go as a family to go and see him. I thought that sending in the cat team was excessive. Were you told at any stage Rocky had not been taking his medication for a period of time? No. If you had been told that he'd been off his medication for a period, would that have changed your mind about whether or not the cat team was necessary? Yeah, I, I would have been seriously concerned. Okay. Concerned enough for the cat team to go out and check on his welfare? Yes, because that was a key indicator that he was unwell. I, I wouldn't have been happy for him to be off medication. Jasmine's mother, Mary, was in the United States when she received a call from her daughter. Jasmine had made up her mind to move out, and she said Rocky had confiscated her mobile phone. Yeah, it was 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I asked her if we could speak the next day. And she said she'd try and get to the library to call. But Jasmine never called back. You say in your statement around 2.30 or 3 on that Tuesday afternoon, you received a phone call at work on your landline, and that was from uh, Jasmine's mum, Mary. That's right. I told her I was ringing from America, that I was really concerned. I was really worried about her safety. I, I asked her. <laughs> oh, oh, would you please go and find Jasmine? Claudia was concerned, but just the day before, on the Monday, she'd spoken to Rocky on the phone. When Rocky was unwell, uh, he would talk in riddles. Did he sound to you to be well on, during that phone call? He was very lucid. I didn't hear any more. Didn't hear any more. Didn't hear any more. I agonise over that conversation. And I know that if I... I also believe I had responsibility to her to ask her more explicit questions, and I didn't. And I live with the what if. What if, a, you know, that was my brother too. And I love Jasmine. And I, I will go with that to my grave, that at that time, if I had done something differently, that that could have changed this event. Nothing from Jasmine. And then the next call was from David to say that she'd been murdered. There's an overlay to all of this, and that is a very intelligent man called Rocky. Intelligent, manipulative, Full well knowing after 20 years uh, the mental health uh, requirements for him, not liking them, uh, could work the system to see that he got what he wanted uh, rather than what the community wanted. Uh, and those kind of people would be hard to manage. Yes, Your Honour. As, 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 as the, his family knows. And he wasn't managed. We're going to go away. We think about things. We'll adjourn to a date to be fixed. Thank you. Everyone have a nice night. It will be two months before the coroner returns to deliver his findings. It's a tough situation for everyone, including his uh, family. Instead of visiting him in hospital, they're visiting him in prison. Rocky was found not guilty of Jasmine's murder on the grounds of his mental illness. But with no appropriate mental institution available in Alice, he's now incarcerated in high security at Alice Springs Jail.
you know, for us now as a family, our main concern is Rocky yeah. and his care. He's in this place where he, it's not really suitable for him. If he's lost in the system now, his life is never going to be the same. Their lives are never going to be the same. But at least they see him. We can't ever see her. In Alice Springs Jail, Rocky Manu shares close quarters with over 600 mainly Indigenous inmates in a prison originally built for 430. And this strain on prison systems has had disastrous consequences for one prisoner who spent his final days shackled to a hospital bed. The coroner's next inquest will be his 53rd death in custody inquiry in 10 years. This family has lost a man they cared for deeply. He became very ill in prison, and they believe the authorities ignored him. There's an anger by his next of kin about him being kept in prison not paroled, getting sick and dying as a prisoner, uh, and not with them at home. Peter Clark was convicted of trafficking marijuana when telephone taps implicated him in a drug bust involving two men bringing two kilos of the drug up to Alice Springs from Adelaide. My dad never drank. He wasn't a drinker, so... Um, Dad was uh, old school. He liked his gunja. He liked to have a smoke. The, the problem with my father was he knew 99.9% .9 of Alice Springs. So everybody knew what he did, and it was no secret. He wasn't the only dealer here in Alice Springs. But, yeah, he was a big fish, and they wanted him. And then they got him. Peter Clark was sentenced to seven years in prison which was reduced to five on appeal. The problem isn't the smoking here in Alice Springs, it's the heavier drugs or, or the alcohol and the violence. And he wasn't, he wasn't that sort of a man. Thank you for coming. It, it really is all about him. We want to find out what happened and how it happened. We want to find the truth of all the circumstances as much as we can in relation to his death. Uh, and uh, we want to learn from his death if possible. When there's a death in custody, it's mandatory that an inquest is held. It's really important for deaths in custody to be examined because when the state has got the duty of care of someone, they shouldn't be able to hide behind that institution to cover up mistakes, mistreatment, wrongdoings, carelessness. Peter Clark's daughter, Kylie, has spent her own money to hire a legal team. Hey, please, well, my name is Ro. I appear for the family of the deceased. I spent my own money because there is never, ever any justice or any um, positive recommendations that come out of these deaths in, death in custody inquiries. Peter's older sister, Gladys, was very close to him. Good morning, Miss Apo. Morning, how are you today? I'm OK for an old bloke. Are you good? Yep. Will you promise to tell the truth? I do. Good on you. I'd like to ask you about when you first became aware of Peter having this cough. He had a smoker's cough. And he had that when he went into prison? Before he went into prison. When he was in prison, it was still there. And from time to time, did you observe that cough? I heard that cough and I told him he needed to get it seen to. The conditions in jail was appalling. Temperatures would reach up to 50 degrees in there with four men in a little room with a maybe $10 Kmart fan blowing on them. That's all they would have. When winter season came, he said he's never, ever, and I quote, been so cold in his life. What the coroner is about to hear will disturb him as he's torn between his personal feelings and the law. My friends who live here love it, but 
Ellis is a town uh, full of problems. I mean, I only see the problems. Don't see much moving to anything else. Alice Springs grew up to service the cattle industry. But with time, this isolated town came to be a home to large numbers of indigenous people who left a harsh existence for the relative comforts of Alice. It's the cutting edge of cultural confusion. They've come in from the desert, live a sedentary life. I was talking to a doctor the other day. The typical heart of a 50-year-old Caucasian is seen in most of the 30-year-old men and younger. Discover fast food, grog, drugs. It was his love of marijuana that brought down Peter Clark, a well-respected Indigenous health worker and father of eight. Before he was in prison for drug trafficking, Peter was a heavy smoker, but generally he was healthy. He was healthy as in his weight, his colour and everything was there. He wasn't visiting the doctor regularly or anything like that. But as soon as he went into jail, that all changed. Weight loss, he was pale, he was frail. He looked like he'd aged 50 years or more. Once Peter Clark died, the autopsy revealed his condition was far worse than previously assessed. He had acute and chronic lung disease. He had emphysema. The end result was that this man had uh, extensive and spreading cancer, almost certainly originating in his lung, which had spread widely throughout his body. How bad and how widespread was the cancer, Doctor? So it had gone um, pretty much completely through the right lung, extensively through the chest, uh, into his pancreas, indeed into his heart, which in my experience, it's unusual to actually have cancer in the heart itself. Counsel assisting the coroner is Jody Truman, a Darwin-based barrister. Go on, Jody. Thank you. Dr Goodwin, could you please tell His Honour your full name? The prison doctor at the time was Gordon Goodwin, who now works in Queensland. Was there anything that you saw that could have indicated to you that he was suffering from lung cancer? I have repeatedly gone over the case in my own mind. I feel from the information provided to me, given a similar scenario, I would do the same process as I did at that time. At any stage, did you consider Mr Clark to be a malingerer? In my limited contact with him, that didn't enter my head. How many patients did you have in uh, about March 2012 in the prison? I don't have a specific answer. I know the prison was close to full, if not overflowing most of the time. Around five, six, seven hundred. Were you the only doctor in the prison at the time? Yes. The prison is full of chronically ill mainly Aboriginal men. And I was a bit surprised to hear today that there was only one doctor for several hundred men who a lot are very, very sick. During his time in prison, Peter Clark was hospitalised several times, once because of pneumonia. The question for the coroner is, shouldn't this aggressive cancer have been detected during those hospital visits? If the cancer had been picked up earlier, then Peter Clark may well have been paroled earlier. He was my dad, and if, if death was his fate, then he could have died at home with us, with his kids, with his family, with dignity and respect, and not, not in jail or in a, in a hospital and alone. I can understand your anger about that. No, I'm not angry. He did the wrong thing, he got caught. But the punishment that he got mm. wasn't deserved. OK. I hear you. And his, his cough was a constant thing. And, and on the phone calls that uh, he made to me, he told me how sick he was. And it just, it just seems to me that nobody gave a damn. And I looked after him from when he was a baby. OK. OK. <laughs> if 
Thank you, Gladys. He rang me and he told me that his chest was sore, that he'd been to the clinic three times and they gave him aspirin and sent him away. And he went back and he, had, he said he went back and he had to beg them to send him to the hospital. And that's when they sent him to the hospital. And he never came home. Peter Clark's health collapsed and he was rushed to Alice Springs Hospital. Once there, he was taken into ICU sedated and then shackled to his bed. Well, I don't like it. It's not dignifying. But I do take their point, you know. Uh, we've all heard about prisoners escaping in their, in, in their hospital gowns or tying the sheets together down, <laughs> down the walls type thing. Uh, I suppose it's pretty easy to feign symptoms. <laughs> How he shackled to bed, I was absolutely dumbfounded and speechless. I didn't know what to say or who to say it to. There was a jail guard sitting at the end of the bed who didn't communicate with us at all. Dr Rajendra Goud was one of the first to see Peter Clark in intensive care. Did you have any recollection as to whether he was shackled at that time? I remember he was from prison and he had uh, two guards and uh, I, yes, uh, I think he was also shackled. Okay. Yeah. And did you at any stage ask for that to be removed? Of course, we did ask the prison guards if it can be removed, but uh, we were told it's uh, policy and uh, there's nothing much uh, we can do about it. I and mean, I thought straight away, well, my brother's unwell. He's not able to actually get up and Look run up away anyway. He's machines. not a dangerous person. Why would you have this man shackled? Something that I don't know, so I'm going to ask, is what kind of shackle? Uh, we have two types of restraints. Uh, we have uh, handcuffs. In the that are used in the hospital. One is handcuffs. And one is a, a leg shackle. A uh, leg shackle is two shackles with a chain. The shackle would be put around the ankle of the prisoner and the other end would be secured to the bed. So there's no, no restriction of movement of the legs as such, apart from the one that's shackled and the chain is... Uh, and is that under the long. sheet and blanket, is it? Under the sheet and blanket, so there's no embarrassment with the visitors come in or anything like that. What's it made of? Metal. So it's a metal to flesh, is it? Yes, sir. Peter Clark was so sick, he was placed in an induced coma so he could gain strength. It was then that the shackles and guards were removed. It's up to governments to listen to me. And I've got to make sure I don't get on a soapbox and make recommendations that are not pragmatic, that are motherhood statements, that don't address all the problems involved in a particular issue. Having said that, I would have thought this guy was so sick he shouldn't have been shackled. I would have thought some kind of phone call straight away to a, a superintendent saying, hey, boss, uh, this is a bit uh, beyond the pale. But they're my personal thoughts. Peter Clark died in Alice Springs Hospital, April the 3rd, 2012. You want to tell me something about the deceased and your concerns about how he died? That's OK, you tell me. If my dad received proper medical treatment, we could have detected his illness, his serious illness, sooner. And the inhumane shackling of my father's ankle. It's OK to have a tear. <laughs> to the hospital bed in ICU, it was just absolutely heartbreaking. To know your dad, your brother, your uncle or friend or loved one was treated worse than an animal. It's not only sickening, but it's inexcusable. The Department of Corrections discretions on uncuffing inmates in critical situations as this one, it needs to be addressed urgently. I love the cemetery as well. And if we could get more Aboriginal health workers in the jail systems, that could be there to help assist with the inmates that are sick in there. It's culturally appropriate for them to speak with somebody of the same culture. Yeah, they gain each other's trust a lot better. 
We'll adjourn now uh, and to then. One, one uh, more Ma thing. Uh, Mary Crittenden. One more thing. Yeah. Uh, we haven't got a death certificate yet. Um, you'll get one when I hand down my findings. Oh, OK. There's a preliminary one there. Yeah. But you'll get one. Remember all those years that Lindy Chamberlain went, went through all those? Yeah. Yeah, well, she wanted the death certificate to say a dingo did it, right? Yeah. And, that, and after the fourth inquest and 20 years went on, she got that. Well, I'll hand down, when I hand down the findings, that means you'll get the official death certificate straight after. OK. OK? Yeah. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you too. The coroner will deliver his findings in several months' time. Oh, wow. Uh, well, brother. <sighs> Miss you. Two months after the inquest into the murder of Jasmine Roenfeldt by Rocky Manu, Greg Kavanagh is ready to deliver his findings. A lot of the Northern Territory is now in session. I'm here to deliver the findings into the death of Jasmine. We hope that they are what both families wanted in terms of some closure. The coroner's findings ran for 46 pages. They confirmed there were serious inadequacies in the system that treated Rocky. Evidence reveals the complete absence of any system at the Central Australian Mental Health Service to ensure appropriate follow-up. That is extraordinary and utterly unacceptable. It should have been obvious that Rocky might become non-compliant with his medication Rocky should have been made aware that a condition of him being granted co-tenancy was that he take his medication and comply with his treatment regime. Since Jasmine's death, the Department of Health has initiated a new system to address these communication failures. These reforms must now be sustained into the future. They cannot be allowed to lapse due to pressures on the mental health system or the issues of staff turnover that often plague the Northern Territory. Because Jasmine did not arrive for work on Tuesday morning, the coroner has determined an approximate time for her death. The Monday evening, two days before her body was discovered. There are many people who gave evidence of their sincere regret and even torment at not being able to do more to help Jasmine. A sad fact is that even if the crisis team or Claudia or the police had been sent out on Tuesday, it would almost certainly not have saved her life. I hope that this finding will help some of those affected by this tragedy to move forward. It will never be the same because you can't bring Jasmine back. You can't change the circumstances of Rocky's life or ours and Mary and their family. But it does offer some way of moving forward. I think that's really important for our families and in our small community in Alice, because it was like a bomb. Jasmine's family would like to see the implementation of a nationwide computerised system monitoring patients on community management orders. I'm fully aware that everyone in this world makes mistakes, but it's not acceptable for us to accept that our systems can make mistakes like this. It's just not acceptable. Over the next year, the ongoing complexities of life in Alice Springs will continue to demand the coroner's attention. This place reminds me of Hogarth's London and all the gin joints there and those terrible drawings of the hell in, 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 in a London in the 17th century. Well, things got better. Things will get better, but it's slow.